de ö, ö, sokat elfelejtettem. Bocsánat kérem. És ö, veleményem szerint a magyar nép a modern családban elég szedvédte. Nem, nem fogok beszélni magyarul. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's always, of course, uh, very moving for me to come to Budapest. Uh, I first came here in 1961, when it was, I suppose, the very first steps of cultural détente. It was very interesting and a uh, moving place. Now, I've got to know the country a good bit better, and... Uh, when I was invited here to talk about the First World War, um, it's inevitable in Hungary that you think about Transylvania. And I was in Transylvania, uh, curiously enough, with the brother of Jolt Nemet, who was then a student at Oxford, as indeed was your Prime Minister, who was my student. And... Um, uh, Jolt's brother took me through, back through from Brussels to Budapest. It was a long drive. And we passed through a little place where there was a, a Calvinist school, a Protestant Calvinist school. I'm a Scotsman. I recognize it at once. And um, there's a terrible air of grimness about it. But I thought back, Transylvania, 1600, that wonderful history of Transylvania, showed that uh, in 1600, the Unitarians were 100% literate, the Calvinists about 80%, the Lutherans about 50%. And I thought of that uh, unremitting, incredibly worthy educational effort in what was then, of course, a far-flung bit of Europe, however wonderful it is. And it's rather melancholy. You know, any time I pass through all that, I think somebody should come up with a peace guilt clause. Because that post-war settlement, uh, look at them all pleased with themselves, pleased as punch. Lloyd George thinks he's Napoleon. Uh, no, uh, Woodrow Wilson thinks he's Jesus Christ. Um, Colonel House, the rest of them looking so pleased with themselves, and what a disaster that peace settlement was. Now, I've chosen as my title, The Endless Terror, Terrible End. I'm not sure who said it. It was one of the Austro-Hungarians, maybe Forgatsch, who was quite influential in the foreign ministry. It's, uh, is it Libyan? Ein schreckliches Ende als ein endloses Schrecken. A phrase like that. Now, what in 1914? A very silly thing to say. What exactly was the terror going on in 1914? You could, of course, assume that the Habsburg monarchy would not go on. Everyone said the Austro-Hungarian Empire will collapse when Franz Josef dies. But no, you can go on. The point about Central Europe at that time is that the Habsburg monarchy rested on the assumption that there was no solution to certain problems. And it would no doubt have gone on and on and on forever. Uh, it's uncomfortable, of course, having a state with different nationalities. Um, every single mediocrity in the land will raise the cause of minority nationalism. Again, I know what I'm talking about because we are now in danger of an independent Scotland, which would be ridiculous. It will simply cause parking problems with yet another embassy and yet another capital. Um, I may say, by the way, the best remark made about Welsh was by uh, Norman Tebbit, who said that uh, Welsh was like a sort of Jurassic Park. You take a fossil, 
You spend a hundred thousand million pounds and you create a monster. Uh, so, so it is. Now, the, um, um, why say terrible, better a terrible end? And it, this introduces my, really a theme which uh, I'll never, never lets me go. Why has any war started with more illusions? If you think of it, the, there's an almost universal assumption that the war will be short. Now, the generals knew they had millions of men. The food ministries knew they could feed armies forever. Uh, and the, when you look into it, the people who got this so wrong were the bankers and the economists. Uh, the economists all said, uh, if you interrupt trade, Germany, a third of the economy, is dependent on foreign trade. England, it's like half. If you interrupt foreign trade, there will be massive unemployment, food riots. Uh, 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 an English minister who resigned in 1914, said, if we go to war now, we will have an 1848, but an 1848 which begins in June. Nonsense, isn't it? Uh, but the bankers weren't any better. Um, I can quote a, a line which is very close to home. It, at a meeting of the Hungarian cabinet in uh, July 1914, the finance minister, who's, uh, I forget his name, uh, the finance minister was asked, Your Excellency, Milto Sargos Urom, um, how long will the state's credit last in this war? And he replied, three weeks. Now, they, were, they all thought the gold standard is sacrosanct. You can't abandon the gold standard. And when your credit goes, that's that. Nobody ever thought, or somebody else said, the governor of the Bank of England, if you think you can fight this war with bits of paper, paper money, you're wrong. Now, here we are. No. And the generals, when it comes down to it, do you know, I imagine the smallest child knows that if you've got a rifle in your hand, you can kill a horse two miles away. Now, why keep cavalry divisions? And yet every army kept cavalry divisions. And feeding those, uh, feeding those poor old horses took an enormous amount of transport. In fact, feeding cavalry horses for the British army in France took up more tonnage than the Germans sunk by submarines. Why do that? I could go on. Why keep fortresses which can be smashed to bits in, matter, in a matter of hours by heavy explosives? You know, it, the illusions go on and on and on. I'll, I'll come back to the biggest one, I think, um, later on. But there's one thing that uh, strikes me about it. Uh, and again, coming back to my Transylvanian school, um, was there ever a generation of statesmen better educated than the men who took Europe into war? If I think back on it, uh, you know, Bettmann Holweg's private secretary was an expert on Parmenides. Haldane, the Secretary of State for War in England, was uh, the translator of Schopenhauer. Uh, Poincaré's brother was a Nobel Prize winning mathematician. And if you read the speeches of that time, they're full of classical literary <coughs> references. I mean, again, to uh, quote a Hungarian example, uh, I, 50 years ago, I read Rof Tisa Istvan Kate Veshla Hazi Bessi Day. And they are masterpieces of, you know, the references are very good. When he wrote German, it's extremely elegant. Uh, and you think, you know, this generation of statesmen, they, you know, what on earth is it 
that made people of that kind of degree of intelligence, education, self-discipline. Why did they do it in 1914? <coughs> <coughs> now, of course, you come back to uh, the idea of nationalism, don't you? Uh, the nation-state was something which everybody in 1914 really you know, put above everything else. Deutschland über alles doesn't mean Germany above all other countries, but put Germany at the top of your mind. That's the meaning of it. And so it is. You know, young men everywhere will be very enthusiastic about the national cause. I believe it's true, for instance, that Bela Bartok, when he uh, went round recording the Romanian peasants' music, was really doing so to show that, in the end, they were, as it were, culturally Hungarian. Um, just as a footnote, I might add, uh, he later on came to Anatolia. He was invited by uh, his Hungary, his Turkish musicologist friend, Adnan Saigun. And Adnan Saigun had the same idea of recording Anatolian music to show that, that the, these peasants were Balkan European and Byzantine in origin and not Arab or whatever. So Bila Bartok would arrive in Anatolia in 1936. He nearly became a Turkish citizen. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he arrived with um, Adnan Saigun with a big motor car and a huge box to record the peasants' music. The peasants were a little apprehensive because if they saw a Christian arriving with a big box, they thought it might be a bomb. Um, so Bartok had to explain to them by citing, by citing the common words between Turkish and Hungarian, which are things like nyereg for saddle and arpa for barley and whatnot. He would do that, and then the peasants would sing. I managed in Vienna to find a recording of these Bartok recordings. I'm afraid to say they sound like... Um, if you can imagine an, an army of vacuum cleaners having a nervous breakdown, they were vile. Um, however, there it was. Bartok goes to Transylvania to try to show that the peasants are really Hungarian. He grew up subsequently. And that's the sort of world of 1914, the nation state. Uh, now, Professor Klotz referred to Francis Fukuyama. That book is better than its title, uh, which was a particularly badly chosen title. And it's, the end of history now seems comic in view of what has happened. Um, but I was thinking that there is a first exercise of uh, ending history, and it's the 1860s. In the 1860s, England seemed to be the miracle country. Uh, it had, apart from your own one, a uh, small, small one, uh, it had the first underground railway. It was the best underground railway of the 19th century. And if you know London, I can still proudly say it is still the best, best underground system of the 19th century. Um, London got rid of cholera in 1860, Hamburg in 1890. I could go on. I don't need to multiply the examples. Uh, London seemed to have a formula. It's now called free market democracy, etc. I'm sure that in 1860 there would be rather more uh, statesmanlike descriptions of these things, such as progress, John Stuart Mill. Um, it's a period when, um, shall we say, people like us are all convinced that progress is happening 
and that you need a constitution, a national bank, and so on and so forth. All these formulae. And nation states follow. And the nation state is, in a way, the, the biggest of the building blocks for this uh, brave new world. I've got a quotation here from John Stuart Mill. Mm. Yeah. Uh, he said, nation states are what you have to have. And then he went on about uh, the, 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 the minorities, the half-savage relics of past times, he called them. And in the same sort of way, Engels regarded even the Czechs and Slovenes as ethnic trash, which should just be Germanized. And there is a world of the confident nation-state coming up. Um, I suppose the, the first of them is, uh, is Italy in 1859, which was a cause supported by, well, almost inclined to say all that was great and good in the 19th century. Earl Gladstone, so on and so forth. Um, the uh, unification of Italy, when it happened, was, as it happens, brought about by fraud. There was a wonderful plebiscite held in Naples and Sicily. Um, and it reads, for the unification of Italy, 800,000. Against the unification of Italy, 300,000. Abstain. Eight million. Um, and Italian elections were like that. Uh, later on in Sicily, by 1912, they declared the results of the elections before they actually happened. And now, one of the uh, great heroes, in a way, of that time is Pope Pius IX. He produced in 1864 uh, a document called The Syllabus of Errors in which he more or less denounced the 19th century. I think there are two great um, productions against the 19th century. One is Dostoevsky, and the other one is Pope Pius IX. Of course, it reads like a crazy document, but he was onto something. He said, don't say that one race or one nation is superior to another. It's an error. When the Italians took over Rome in 1870-71, Pius IX retreated to the Vatican heroically, and he appealed to the Catholic world not to recognize the Kingdom of Italy. Only one country responded to his call, Ecuador. I don't know why, but there it was. Now, the, the nation state, as it comes up, is, well, here, uh, Germany and Italy. It's worth asking the question, isn't it? Uh, why is it that uh, Italy produced Mussolini? And you can take the, uh, the whole thing back really to 1915. Here was a country which was terribly weak. I remember coming here in, in Hungary in 1986 or 87, and I saw a film of Hungarian veterans of these battles of the Isonzo, uh, who had been invited by the Italian government to, it must have been the anniversary of Caporetto or something, and to by the Italian government, these old men, they were filmed, it was a, quite a well-known Hungarian film at the time, these old men were just crying into the river. Uh, the Italians would do the same thing. What a disastrous thing to do, to get involved in the First World War. Now, why is it that Italy, again, produces the first fascist movement? I don't know what the answer is. Uh, it's, uh, it's, there are splendid Italian commentators on it, but the relationship of Italian liberalism to... That kind of nationalism is, well, dangerous. Now, without Mussolini, there would have been no Hitler. Uh, Mussolini gave Hitler the ideas. It even includes the, the colored shirts 
The idea of having colored shirts for a political party. Mussolini got the black shirts from the Bersaglieri, I think, a regiment in the Italian army which wore black. Hitler got brown because an Austrian businessman had heard that jungle uniforms for the German army in East Africa had ended up in Adana or Mersin in southern Turkey. And this enterprising businessman bought them up and went to Hitler and said, would you like some brown shirts? Um, <laughs> I don't think that Hitler added anything to the ideas of fascism except, of course, anti-Semitism, because Mussolini was not that to start off with. Now, uh, every serious German historian looks at the question of Hitler. Where did that come from? I mean, one couldn't possibly blame Bismarck. The only thing uh, you can say about it is that uh, because Bismarck, well, in the end, he was a militarist, wasn't he? Uh, he allowed the army more say than perhaps it should have done. And it's, that, I think, comes into, really, in the end, is what brings about the First World War. The, the German army, again thinking of itself, not wrongly, as uh, the leader of the nation, in the end pushes for war in 1914 because they say, if all this goes on, France and Russia will be so strong that they'll crush us by 1917. Everybody in 1914 looked at Russia and said, this is the country of the future. This will be a superpower. And I think after the Balkan Wars, when Austria looked as if it was on the way out, uh, it looked as if Russia and her satellites would block the Germans' road to the Ottoman Empire. The German generals panic. Uh, and when everything went wrong at the end, lots of papers were destroyed or vanished. But from bits and pieces of evidence, we can see that when the Sarajevo assassination happened, an accident, the Germans say, let's have a showdown with Russia. Um, and so the army goes ahead. Now, what a mad way to run a great country. Um, I think myself the biggest mistake in German history was to build a navy against, uh, against England. Uh, I mean, it, it was an obvious attempt to blackmail the English, and Admiral Turpitz, bless him, Admiral Tur Turpitz came up with the theory that if the British take on the German Navy, we will sink a third of their ships, so all our ships will be sunk, but then when the British fight the French, all their ships will be sunk. Uh, I mean, a, a lunatic idea by a very clever man. Um, the sh these ships each cost four million rice marks. And in the event, they spent more or less the whole of the war bottled up in Friedrichshafen. Then in November 1918, they rebelled and overthrew the empire. Meanwhile, they had taken a third of the defense budget crazy. But that's it. The world of 1914 is full of crazinesses of this sort. Now, I'll, um, uh, I, um, I asked uh, Maria Schmidt's permission if on this occasion, coming from me, it would be permitted to criticize Hungary. <laughs> uh, you know the cliches as well as I do. It's a wonderful city, Budapest. Um, you know, every little corner of it, there's something. And I'm, I've learned a lot from my uh, exposure to Hungary, and I read, you know, the, the history. Uh, to my shame, I only got round to reading the Banfi trilogy two years ago, 
It's the fault of, of uh, Mihai Segedi Mossack, who's a friend. Uh, he, it was he who promoted the book in the middle of the 80s, and he never told me about it. I'll never forgive him. It's a wonderful book. Anyway, that's by way of introduction to some critical remarks. Uh, 1867, Great Hungary comes up. And I'm not going to try to be naive in the way Robert Seaton Watson was. That, that's a silly book. The book, uh, the, you know, blaming Hungary for the non-promotion of Slovak or Romanian. It, it's, uh, I wouldn't go uh, in that direction. It's, um, assimilation of minorities is something which, well, I mean, I can see it in Turkey with the Kurds. Uh, you know, I, you hear the headlines about uh, oppressed Kurds, but as I speak, a Kurd is forgetting Kurdish and speaking Turkish because there are seven Kurdish languages. This sort of problem, assimilation is not at all a senseless idea. In fact, I think, you know, if we're talking the language of human rights, what about the human right of a child to be educated in a serious language? Uh, it's one. Now, I don't want to be naive about that, but there is one thing, I, one big mistake, I think, that the Hungarians of that time made. Um, you know, the whole First World War could have been avoided somehow if an answer had been found to the South Slav question. Uh, Edmund von Gleishorstenau, who was the Austrian military representative at Brest-Litovsk, uh, who became uh, Hitler's commanding general in Zagreb, said in a, his, his, his memoirs are absolutely wonderful read. He was a very good stylist. Things wrong with him, of course, but he said, and he's Hitler's man in Zagreb, the only good thing that emerged from the, the post-war treaties was Yugoslavia. And when you think of the troubles that we got, you can see what he means. I was very much, by the way, in favor of, uh, of, um, of Croatia and Slovenia, because when you reached 1990, the only way out of communism was, I thought, nationalism. It's not ideal, but the only way. Now, uh, why didn't the Austro-Hungarian Empire set up, a, let's call it Illyria, or something of that sort. Sensible Serbs, many of them educated in, in Hungary, relations with the Hungarians were very good. Many Serbs would have been quite happy to go into some arrangement with the Habsburg Empire. Its capital wouldn't have been Belgrade, it would have been Zagreb, probably, and it would be uh, a functioning Yugoslavia. And it's there, I think, that the Hungarians got in the way. Uh, if that question came up, uh, even István Tiso, hugely intelligent man, simply said, no, we are not having a third unit in, to challenge the position of Hungary. Hungary, of course, had a, a pretty privileged position by 1914. And Louis Neymar, uh, the English historian, called it uh, the, uh, the machinery of, of, of wheels and levers, which made one of the small peoples of Europe into a great power. And uh, Tisa always got in the way of, whenever it was suggested that Dalmatia under Austria should be put together with Croatia and Slavonia under Hungary uh, as a Croat unit, Croat language extended, and then some sort of link done through the Krajina Serbs with Belgrade, and of course including Bosnia. Would it not have been some kind of answer to the South-South problem? And there I think, you know, it's the Hungarians who blocked it. The other, the other thing that I've never understood, 
And, and I suppose we're on the 95th anniversary today of uh, the, uh, the uh, revolutionary events in Budapest, which brought uh, uh, Mihai Karoi in. Must have been 95 years ago to this day. Why didn't Mihai Karoi go in 1916 to London and set up an exile government? It would have been quite a sensible and understandable move to make. And by 1916, it was pretty clear that if, uh, that whatever happened, Austria-Hungary was going to lose. I mean, as, as uh, Ciano put it in 1942, if England wins, we lose. If Germany wins, we're lost. And uh, the, it was clear enough by 1916, and, and no, there is that kind of, uh, that desperation which went on, which wasn't prepared to compromise. And it was, you know, it's, it's a quality of the Hungary of that time. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, uh, poor old Hungary. Uh, as I say, uh, I think we should really have a peace guilt clause for that preposterous peace that followed the First World War. It was an obvious invitation to a Second World War, paved the way for Hitler. I don't blame the Germans for that. No more than uh, would I blame Hungary for the siege of 1944-45. But it's that kind of mad world which these highly educated people, believing in progress, quoting John Stuart Mill, it's that world that they gave us. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.